Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise Him. Let's stand tonight. Now, I want you to turn around and find somebody you maybe haven't spoke to yet. And I want you to wave at them and smile real big. Just a real big smile. And now don't that make you feel better? It's Wednesday night. Some people call it hump day, middle of the week. Some people have had a rough few days already. And some people aren't looking forward to the last part. So it's kind of one of those days in the middle where you're, you're, you're hoping to regroup a little bit at church. Let's regroup tonight. Let's just go into the presence of the Lord and let the Lord just kind of fill us up all over again tonight. Just let the presence of the Holy Ghost fill us up. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsty of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup. Fill it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you tonight. God, we praise you tonight. We magnify you, God, and glorify your name. Lord, we invite you to fill this place. Let the Holy Ghost come in this house. Let your blessing come in this house. In the name of the Lord, we invite you, O oh God, from the front to the back, from the left to the right. God, just fill this place tonight. Send your refreshing upon us, O oh God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We're in the church today. Thank you for his mercy and his grace for what he's done in our lives. Hallelujah. Thank you. Oh, God is so good, isn't he? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to look to the Lord in prayer this evening, taking these needs before him. I know that uh, when we ask him, he's going to hear and he's going to answer our prayers. Hallelujah. He already knows what we have need of, the Bible says. But he said, but ask. All right, but ask. Amen. So we've got a right to go before the Lord tonight and can come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need in our lives. Amen. So thank God that he's there for us to hear and to answer our cry. Amen. Several uh, tonight in need of a physical touch, in need of a healing. Uh, just reading some from the list tonight. Uh, the Massey family, of course, very much in need. And we heard about Donnie that, uh, you know, he needs a special touch with some upcoming, uh, upcoming things going on in his life. And also uh, for Don Knapp, uh, as listed here, that uh, he has cancer. We de definitely need to pray for him. Arlene Rose uh, and uh, Keith and Carol Little. Uh, Sheila Feast, Feist. Listed here, uh, Kathy Coates. Uh, so several we need to pray about for a physical touch in their body, a healing. But we know God's able. Amen. There are no impossibilities with God. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen. So we're going to believe the Lord tonight. Why don't we just take these to the Lord in prayer and ask God to meet and supply this need. Oh, Lord, we come before you tonight, Jesus. I, I thank you. Praise God, praise God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, Sister Weddle, would you uh, pray over these? Thank you. Hallelujah. All right, now's the time in the service that we invite people that need prayer uh, to come on up. And uh, we're going to do what the Bible tells us to do. We're going to pray over you. We're going to believe the Lord together. Amen. So why don't you come on up forward tonight if you want prayer. Amen. Praise God. Now if uh, the rest of you would gather in, some that would gather in tonight and pray with these who have come for prayer tonight.
changing hand. Oh, 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 oh. God, we worship you. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. All praise to you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. You may be seated. Ushers, make your way on up. Give and it shall be. What's the rest of that? Given unto you. Shaking together and running over. That's right. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We feel you in this place. We feel you in this place. We feel Jesus. I pray right now, God, as we worship you in our giving tonight, that God, we give out of a cheerful heart. That, Lord, we give it, that it be multiplied into the kingdom of God. And that souls be added to the kingdom. Souls be added to the kingdom people be filled with the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.
just lift your hands. Let's just entertain the presence of the Lord for a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we exalt you. We magnify you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be your mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Oh, just to feel you, Jesus. Just to know you're in this place. <coughs> hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Anointing fall upon us tonight. Blessed be your mighty name. Praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Would you stand with me tonight? Two verses of scripture to begin tonight. Not unfamiliar to all of us here. First Peter chapter 5. Peter writing to the church. Talking about Christian service and exhorting the elders and then the younger, telling us that we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And then he says in verse 8, be sober. These are instructions. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. You know, he can devour. He can devour. He goes on to verse 9, instructing us, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I want to speak to you tonight for the next few minutes. Bound soldiers cannot fight. Bound soldiers cannot fight. Jesus, Lord, I need your help tonight. I need your help to deliver the word to this congregation. God, that you would enable me as a servant of the Lord under the anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost to speak your word, preach the word. And God, let the word come forth with power and with authority. God, let it speak to us, each one tonight, in this place, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask it. Now, one more time, will you lift your hands to God? Lord, we worship you, Jesus. We exalt you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name. Oh, that's it. Just let the Holy Ghost, just let the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
My, 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 my. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. A first grader stood in the front of his classroom to make a speech about what I want to be when I grow up. And he stood there very confident looking at the class and he said, I want to be a lion tamer and have lots of fierce lions and I'll walk into the cage and they will roar. Then he thought about what he'd said for a moment. And he, after thinking about it just a bit, he added, but of course, my mom will be with me. <laughs> On that note, you may be seated. Many years ago, still living in Charleston, living in the west side of the house that my wife and I lived in after we got married, um, this was even before I was in church, I came home one day to find a window broken out in my house, and to walk into my house and find some articles missing from my house. I was quite upset. I, I felt like, where are you safe now? How is it that I'm living in a home where I can lock the door and I'm supposed to feel security in my home and feel safe? And now someone whom I don't know to this day, I don't know who it was that violated my security, violated my safety. I have to tell you, repaired the window. Window looked like it did before, before the house was broken into. But I got to tell you, I never felt safe again. Not like I did. Not till my wife moved in and I knew there was someone there to protect me. But there's something about when someone breaks into a place, or your home or some place that you have that you feel is secure. That you feel you've got, uh, you, you can go there and you can relax and you can be away from everything. and No one is going to bother you. No one is going to uh, come in and, and you, you're, you're, you're safe there. It's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a haven that you can go to and be there. But let me tell you something. The devil does not have a problem stepping into your territory. The devil is not shy about showing up at your door uninvited. Even living here in Ravenswood several years ago, we were asleep probably two or three in the morning and somebody knocked on our door and, and our, our bedroom is, is right there right beside the front door and someone knocked on the door and I jumped up and you can look out the, the windows right there and I kind of like smart thing to do is you peek out the window and you look to see who it is. Well, there was a woman standing out there. I didn't know her, didn't know who it was. She was standing right outside our front door. And I told my wife, I said, you need to get your cell phone and be ready to call the police. Uh, we, may, we may need them. I went over and I opened the door ever so slightly. And uh, I, I said, can I help you? And she said, she said, my boyfriend has beaten me up, and, and she didn't look like she was lying. And she, she was acting real squirrely, if you know what I mean. And, 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 and so I, I was very cautious, and she said, I, uh, could you let me in your house? 
he, he, he's out, out here looking for me. And so I, I said, well, I said, my wife's on the phone right now. Uh, she's ready to call the police. She said, oh, no, don't call the police. Don't, don't call the police. And she kept looking around the corner, and I, I, I have no doubt that boyfriend was around the corner. And, and this was, was a setup and so forth, and fortunately we, we escaped unscathed from that incident. But the devil doesn't mind showing up. He, 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 just because you're blood bought, just because you're Holy Ghost filled, just because you talk in tongues, just because you live holy, the devil don't mind showing up. He, matter of fact, he, he, he doesn't mind at all uh, showing up and, and he's more likely to show up when you're living for God and you're, you're walking for God and you're, you're, you're living in truth. Just because you've been born again doesn't mean your battles are over. Doesn't mean the devil is going to stop and just leave you alone. As a matter of fact, you can count on it. He is going to show up. He's going to come knocking on your door and he's going to do everything within his power to try to immobilize you as a saint of God. You have become public enemy number one. You have become a threat to the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of hell. Every time you pray, hell is at attention because they're scared to death what you're going to pray about and what you're going to ask for and what you're going to shake heaven for. The battles aren't over. And if the devil can bind you, he's going to bind you. If he can hinder you, he's going to hinder you. And I'll tell you right now, a soldier that is bound cannot fight. General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, he kept a book on his desk at all times. It was a book by a man named Sun Tzu. It was written about the 5th century. And it's very, uh, it's studied in our war colleges even now. And the title of the book was The Art of War. Only 13 chapters in the whole book of The Art of War. But one of the concepts in The Art of War is that you need to know your enemy. You need to know who your enemy is. And if you know you have an enemy, then you know that you're in a battle. And it is a fight. The Bible even tells us not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. We need to know our enemy. And the more you know about your enemy, and you know how he moves and how he thinks and what motivates him, the better you're able to devise a means of counteracting him. Of, of coming against him when he moves in and tries to defeat you. When he moves in and he tries to bind you to overcome the enemy. We got to understand why it is so important to resist the enemy. That's what Peter said. Peter said, whom resist steadfast in the faith. We've all heard the story, we've all heard the story of David and Goliath, learned it in Sunday school. Some of you have taught it in Sunday school. Great story. I've shouted, I've shouted when people preach about David and Goliath. It's exciting to, to hear the story and the victory of David and Goliath. And when they, when that preacher hits that crescendo, and says what David said, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Man, that just ignites a fire on the inside of me. We, but we got to understand. And it reminds me when we talk about David and Goliath. That, that our faith in God brings us victory. That victory is ours if we'll believe for it. That victory is ours if we'll claim it. That victory is ours if we'll resist the enemy. But why was it so important? 
Why was it so important to defeat this giant? They had fought the Philistines before. As a matter of fact, just a few chapters before, the Philistines had taken the ark. And they had fought them before. They had fought the Amalekites just a few chapters before. So what was it about this giant? What was it about this enemy that they were facing, that they had fought many battles before this battle? And Goliath would come out on that field of battle. And Goliath would look at the encampment of the Israelites and see the flag of Saul up there waving. But Saul nowhere to be seen and no soldiers anywhere. Come on up, Packers. Because Saul and the armies of the Lord God of Israel had become bound by this giant. He had bound them. Come on up. Goliath, get up here. Now this, just a little illustration. This is just my hands bound. Just a little illustration of what the enemy, the giant, had done to the entire army of Israel. Literally hiding in their tents away from him for fear of Goliath. What was it about this giant? They, the, the, their battles, they, they had fought battles. They had won battles. They would lost some battles. But what was it about this giant that he represented that brought such fear and such bondage to an entire army, to a king? They literally could do nothing. They would not fight him for fear. Let me tell you something. Fear is one of the bondages the devil uses. Now, he can use fear. He can use depression. He can use doubt. He can use all kinds of things to bring bondage into your life. This, this rope represents a whole lot of bondage. He can use sin. He could use anger. He can use bitterness. He can use offense. I'm not talking about a fence. I'm talking about being offended. And he can use that to bind the armies of the Lord God of Israel. The Bible says, 1 Samuel, Chapter 17, verse 8. He stood and he cried. This is Goliath. He stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able, now here it is. Here. Is why they were, they were so afraid. This is why they were cowering in their tents. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail, if I win this battle against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants. And serve us. In other words, if I win this battle, and this is what brought such fear to the armies of Israel. If I win this battle, then you are going to be my slaves. You are going to be in bondage. You are going to be bound for the rest of your lives. It would have changed the entire direction of the nation of Israel if that battle had been lost to that Philistine giant. It would have changed everything. 
it would have changed it all. If Goliath had lived, it, the direction of God's people would have been changed forever. And that giant came to the door of the children of Israel and bound them. And bound soldiers cannot fight. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying if the enemy has come to your door and the enemy has come to you with bondage and strongholds, then he has, he has bound you and you are not a warrior in the army of the Lord because bound soldiers cannot fight. See, this wasn't just one battle to Goliath. This, was, this, this wasn't just one, one fight. Goliath did not come just to fight this battle against them. He came to bring bondage. Sound familiar? He came to bring bondage. He came to bring slavery. Doesn't the Bible tell us that Satan comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy? That Satan brings bondage into our lives. That Satan will chain us up if he can. We live an entire generation that lives in chains. See, that sounds just like the battles we fight. That, that, that sounds like just the, the, the same war that you're in and I'm in. And we're fighting against a foe. And it's not just for him to win a battle. It's not just for him to, 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 to get another, another uh, 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 in his belt. Notch. It's not for him just to get another notch in his belt. He's coming to bind you. He doesn't just want to win a battle with you. He wants to take you out of the army. He wants to take you out of the fight. He wants to take you out. He wants to pull you off to the side. He doesn't mind bruising you in the battle. That's okay. He'll bruise you. But he wants to do more than bruise you. He wants to bind you. He wants to put you in a spiritual bondage. Because bound soldiers cannot fight. Bound soldiers cannot fight. You've got bondage in your life. It has put you off to the side. It has sidelined you in the fight. And if there has been, if, if there had not been a David, if there had not been a David to step out onto that battlefield, if there had not been this young shepherd boy that walked out on the battlefield that day, God's people would have become slaves to the enemy because the day would have come that, they, that, that the Philistines said, enough's enough. Come on, Goliath, let's go. We're just going to take the encampment and we're going to take the whole army because they're not going to fight. They're not going to lift a sword because they're bound. They're bound. They're bound. And we got to understand, we've got to resist the devil, so that he will flee from us. It wasn't about winning just another battle. Folks, the spiritual giants that you and I face, the spiritual giants that come against us, they've got the same agenda. They've got the same thing that they're trying to do. They've got the same thing that they're trying to achieve. They, they're, they're coming to, to defy the armies of God. They're coming, they, they are coming to bring a reproach to the people of God. And they are coming to bind you, to create strongholds and bondage and captivity in our lives. Oh, sometimes, I, I, I know, most of us, God's never going to get you on a bar stool. Well, God won't. Well, the devil won't either is what I'm saying. Devil won't ever get you on a bar stool. He'll never get you in an alley buying drugs. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll never get you in a place where you commit adultery or some kind of immoral sin. But those secret things, those hidden bondages, 
those things that come that we think aren't a big deal. Those things that we allow and we entertain in our... You want to know where your battles are won and lost at with the devil? Right here. Right here. They are won and they are lost right here. Bondages are created right here. We talked about your heart. Your heart is the seat of your emotions. It, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's the very core of your being, your decision making. It's your mind. It's your mind. And that's where the enemy fights. And he'll put a thought in there that is so far from truth, but sounds enough like truth. That he will bring you, bring you to a place where, where you, you just don't know what to do. And you, you feel like you've been betrayed. And you feel like you have, you, you've been hurt or, you, or this or that. And, and he will use that against you to create bondage in your life until eventually he's got you bound. Until eventually he's got you in a place where you are a soldier that cannot fight. Yeah, he's got you cowering in a tent somewhere because of something. And let me tell you something. Most of the time, it's not even true. Sometimes it might be true. But it's how you deal with it that matters. It's how you handle it that matters. So you have to understand, according to the word of God, our defense is resistance. It's resisting. 1 Peter chapter 5, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, folks, that, I, I really took pause on that verse today when I was studying. The same affliction. In other words, somebody that's got the Holy Ghost, somebody baptized in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, somebody that, that, that's living holy, somebody can have the same bondage as somebody in the world. Those same afflictions are accomplished just like your brethren that are in the world. And you're not alone. You're not, a, you're not alone in it. You're not the only one that's ever had to have a, have a fight with the devil. You're not the only one the devil showed up at your door. You're not the only one that, that the devil's tried to deceive you. You're not, the only, you're not the only one that he's tried to plant seeds of doubt in your spirit. You're not the only one that he's tried to just cower in a corner out of fear. You're not the only one that he's tried to, to, to bring bitterness into your soul. You, you, you are not alone. But if you're going to overcome, you've got to resist him steadfast in the faith. Why? Faith don't change. The faith is the same. Faith don't change. The Bible tells us to submit ourselves, therefore, unto God. And what? Resist the devil. And what will he do? He will flee. He'll show up. But if you will resist him, if you won't listen to him, if you won't entertain that stuff in your mind, if you will overcome that and rebuke it, in the name of Jesus Christ, the devil can't hang around somebody that submits themselves to God. The devil can't hang around. He'll show up, but he can't stay there. If you resist him, he cannot stay. We've got to, re we've got to yield to God in all things. Submit yourself to God. That means in everything. Every part of your life, you've got to submit yourself to God. You've, you've, got to, you've got to allow God to be Lord over every part of your life. Somebody say amen. amen. He's got to be Lord over every part of your life.
Because if he's not Lord over every part of your life, you got a part of your life that's exposed. You got a part of your life that, that the enemy can have access to. You got a part of your life that, that the enemy is able to step in, get through the crack in the door or whatever. He's got to be Lord. Submit yourself, therefore, to God and resist the devil. Steadfastly in the faith by yielding yourself to God. You've got to completely resist him. You can't, you can't allow a little bit of devil. Hello? You, you, you can't entertain a little bit of devil. And expect him to just, oh, okay, this little bit's not worth it. No, if you let him in, he's in. And he's not in for a little bit because it won't be long. That little bit will become a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. That's why the Bible says give no place. No place. Everybody say no place. You ever had people? They show up at your house and you don't want them there? You don't have to say yes. You already did, but you don't want them. You really don't want them there. And so you see them pull up in the driveway. Man, the lights go out and television goes off. On the floor. Everybody, on the floor. On the floor. Because you know if they're in, they're not leaving. That cup of coffee all of a sudden becomes dinner. And then they got to stay for watermelon when it gets dark. I'm not speaking about anybody specific. Don't be thinking that. But you don't, the Bible says no place. Give him no room, no room to the enemy. A couple weeks ago, I got a letter from the bank. It said important notice. So I thought it was important notice. I opened it. It was important notice. Excuse me. And the notice, the notice basically said that we will never contact you. You ever, you ever, you ever got a notice like this? We will never contact you and ask for your bank account information over the phone. We'll never do that. So I felt safer. But also realize that if they're telling me that, there's somebody out there who will call my house eventually and want my bank account number, Sister Hayes. They'll want, they'll want my bank account information. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, they are going to talk to me like we went out, to, we went out for breakfast yesterday. And they are going to make me feel like they're doing me a favor. By calling me, you're going to get $12,000 in the mail, but I need your bank account information. In other words, the truth is there's somebody out there that would deceive me. There's somebody out there that, that would do everything within their power to try to pull the wool over my eyes and deceive me. They'll be professional. They'll, they'll, they'll be convincing. And, and, and the whole time, the, what they're trying to do is steal from me. They're, they're not going to tell me that this is going to empty out my bank account. And they're not going to tell me that this is probably going to give them access to a credit card. And they're, they're not going to tell me that they're going to run that credit card up and it's gonna, I'm going to have to pay on that for the rest of my life. 
and they're not going to tell me it's going to cost me 29.7% interest. They're not going to tell me any of that. Because that's the way the devil works. He is a deceiver. And he will, he will come in and he don't tell you what it's going to do to you. And he don't tell you how it's going to bind you. And he don't tell you how, how it, it's going to cause misery in your life. And he doesn't tell you that it's going to destroy your home. And he don't tell you that it's going to do this and it's going to do that. But he's going to come knocking at your door. And he's going to come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's going to build a stronghold in your mind and in your heart out of deception. He is a deceiver. He captures us with a thought. And if we're not careful, he owns us with a thought. That's why we've got to resist the devil. That's why we've got to resist. He can bind you with a thought. Then he owns us. And bound soldiers cannot fight. And he knows that. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober. Sober means you need to take the battle seriously. You need to be aware there's a battle raging. And you need to understand you're part of that battle. And you're in that battle. So you need to take it seriously. You need to care about the battle. And not let everything that comes into your mind create a stronghold in your spirit. He said, be vigilant. You got to watch. You got to watch. They're telling us in Ravenswood. Police told somebody the other day in Ravenswood that people, if you leave your door unlocked, People are just walking up to your house and walking in. And people you don't know. They're just coming up to your house. They're just, they're just walking in. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to be sober. You've got to take this seriously. I came home today and walked in the house. Kenji was in the kitchen. And I walked straight into the family room. I had to put something on my desk. Walked in. And she, I heard from him. Hello. I didn't even say anything. Probably should have, but I didn't. And I walked in, and Kenzie said, oh, good. She said, I'm expecting to say hello, hello one of these days and hear a voice I don't recognize. That's how the devil works, folks. Put James chapter 4. i got to finish. I know. i gotta, I got to get done. James chapter 4. Submit yourselves. Therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Just cleanse your hands, you sinners. and Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves. In the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But thou judge the law. Thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. I want you to look, look at the progression of those verses. Look at the progression. First, you surrender to God. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. You resist the devil. You draw near to God. Once you have surrendered, and then you're on your journey of drawing near to God. Then he says you cleanse your hands. That's, that's, that's God's sanctification. That's sanctification in your God. God sanctifying you. God working in your life and cleansing your hands, purifying your hearts. And then in verse 9, he said, be afflicted and mourn and weep. In other words, be serious because spiritual warfare is not a game. This is not a game. 
And he said, humble yourself. Then he gets to the last verse and he says, don't speak evil of a brother or judge. In other words, no gossiping, no backbiting, no, no slander. Because quite honestly, those are works of the devil. Those are not works of God. Those are works of the devil. And whatever you allow, and I, I, I could go through all of that, but we don't have time. Whatever you allow to reside or to be tolerated in your mind, listen to me. Whatever you allow to reside or to be tolerated in your mind will become your stronghold. It will become your stronghold. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. You cannot allow the enemy to bind you. And if you've been bound tonight, tonight's the night you need to break it off and get rid of those. Tonight's the night. You can be bound by being hurt. And we've all been hurt. There's not a person in this place that hasn't been hurt somewhere along, along your, your journey and your walk with God. We've all been hurt somewhere, sometimes within, sometimes without, but we've been hurt. You cannot allow that hurt to become a stronghold in your life. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our trials and in our tests that we allow them to become strongholds. Because that's all we talk about, that's all we think about, is our trials and our tests. And they consume us. And they become a stronghold in our life. There are things that the enemy uses that seem so innocent. But yet he uses them to bind soldiers. Because bound soldiers cannot fight. Stand with me. Bound soldiers cannot fight. That's why the Bible, you, you read through Scripture, the Bible talks constantly about guarding your heart, guarding your mind. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Talks about your conversation, what you say, what you hear, what you listen to. Anything that gives the enemy any type of access has to be guarded. We have to guard ourselves so that the enemy doesn't create a bondage in our life. It will affect your worship. It'll affect your praise. It, it will affect your faith. It'll affect your church attendance. It, 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 will, it will affect everything, everything spiritual about you. We've got to break that. In Jesus' name. 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 Jesus name. Why don't you step out? Sister Missy, start singing. Why don't you step out? Make your way to the front tonight. Victory is mine. Oh, yeah. There Victory. it is.